So seed institutions are these institutions that maybe are very small right now. Maybe they're very obscure, but they're probably going to have currency among young people. They're going to have currency among smart people, among early adopters. Um, they're going to be positioning themselves uh, in ways that are robust to to systemic disruption and and maybe are even anti-fragile. And, and those institutions are going to become really the next generation of institutions as um, you know, what you kind of characterize as the boomer gerontocracy ages out. All right. What's up, everybody? I am Justin Murphy. This is the Other Life Podcast. We have an excellent episode for you this week. I'm really excited to share this one with you. Today, I talked with Wolf Tyvee. He is the editor-in-chief of Palladium Magazine. Some of you probably know of Palladium. Maybe some of you are avid readers of Palladium. It's basically a magazine, but they have a much larger vision and a larger machinery that's organized around this this magazine. Their real long-term vision is to reboot the paradigm of American governance as a whole. They have really ambitious long-term goals of revivifying the American government as we know it. And they're trying to do it through a return to serious first principles intellectual work. That's kind of their their ground level approach is to organize smart thinking, independently minded people to really tackle the problem in a erudite and and committed truth seeking way. And so people who watch this podcast or listen to this podcast We'll see the obvious overlap between you know what they're doing and, and what I've been doing in the past few years. So there was a lot for us to cover. It was really interesting. I think you'll find this very rewarding and stimulating if you are working on any type of project that involves trying to create some kind of novel institution or organization that's kind of on the margins of contemporary institutions, but is trying to, um, in the long run, reshape those institutions. If that's how you think about things, I think you're going to love this interview because that's very much how they see it. But we also talk about different types of substantive ideas. We go deep into Wolf's personal perspective and, and theories on American governance. We talk about the trend of people who are talking a lot about cloud cities or charter cities or what Balaji calls the network state, this cluster of ideas or this meme that's very popular right now. Uh, Wolf gives, a, gives us an interesting diagnosis of all of that. And we also talk about, you know, exit versus voice and this uh, classic paradigm that is a very popular framework for thinking through these different strategic choices when it comes to trying to do something, you know, that that really changes the institutional landscape. Should you leave it and try to overthrow it or should you work from within? I think uh, Wolf and, and the Palladium crew more more broadly have uh, a very nuanced perspective on this, which I really appreciated. And so I would say if you're interested in alternative institution building, if you're interested in different models for sustaining the independent intellectual life, as I know many of you are, uh, but also just if you're interested in political theory, I think this is the episode for you. Um, we talk a lot more about different substantive political theoretical ideas that Wolf calls Palladium a luxury political theory project. I love that. I think that I think that's really interesting and cool. And so we talk about aesthetics and and yeah, just his vision, uh, both individually, but also the, the larger project of Palladium. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. So check it out. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, that's all I got for now. Real quick, before we get to the actual podcast, I just want to remind you a quick word from our sponsor. We now have a sponsor for the podcast. That's right, folks. We are, uh, we're big leagues now. The sponsor for this podcast is IndieThinkers.org. IndieThinkers.org is a private community specifically for independent intellectuals. So it tries to provide the structures and systems that are needed for people to do long-term intellectual work if they don't have an organization or they don't have an institution at all. Just, you know, the various bloggers and authors and you, whether it be YouTubers or podcasters or whatever, Indie Thinkers is totally uh, medium agnostic. But the, the common thread for everyone there is that people are trying to work on serious, long-term, personal, independent, intellectual or creative work. And they're trying to do it in a way that's more highbrow than this kind of, you know, clickbait, you know, super high growth, short term strategies that dominate on places like YouTube or whatever. So that's what we're trying to figure out in IndieThinkers.org. I'm a member myself. I actually, you know, help build the thing. So IndieThinkers.org, if you're interested in that, just go to IndieThinkers.org and uh, you can request an invitation. That's our sponsor for the podcast today. All right. On to the show. All right. What's up, everybody? Other Life Podcast. I am here today with Wolf Tyvee, who is the editor-in-chief of 
Palladium Magazine. Wolf, first of all, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Uh, it's great to be on, Justin. For my audience who might not know about Palladium, you know, the way the way I would kind of summarize it as I understand it is that Palladium is basically trying to really address the fact that American government is really just kind of increasingly atrocious. And it's and it's it's increasingly obvious, I think, to many people that pretty much it's like there are really no real ideas coming out of, you know, American statesmen. It's uh, we have like a, 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 a completely uh, eroding, awful public infrastructure pretty much all of American government is this like ridiculous boomer tier, uh, like a set of ideas, norms and practices, which is pretty much like grinding to a halt. And I, I see palladium as basically, um, you know, it's like you guys are trying to be the adults in the room and you're basically saying, you know, we should be able to get to the bottom of what's going on institutionally from an intellectual perspective. We should be able to build accurate and serious maps of how these things actually function. And we should be able to actually create a compelling vision of where serious statesmen should try to take America. And from your perspective, it's actually quite a promising and optimistic future. There are a lot of uh, possibilities that are there for the taking. If only we could have a kind of uh, intellectually serious uh, governing set and some sense of the community and the network processes that that will be required to get there. So that's that's my way that I see Palladium from what I know about it as a as a as a somewhat distant bystander. But from your perspective as as editor in chief, I would love for you to just kind of tell my audience how how you see the essential project and what I got right or what I got wrong there. Yeah. Yeah, I think you did a great job summarizing basically how we see the world. Um like you said, basically the American regime is not doing very well. Um, now, we actually trace this primarily to the intellectual problem at the root. And the intellectual problem is that we don't know how to think about government, right? So it's it's more than just the immediate issue of, oh, you know, we need new energy, we need a new institutional generation, we need serious people in the room. It's also, we need a new worldview. We need a new way of thinking about what government is for, what government is, what America is for, all those kinds of things. So so besides just looking at America, we also look around the world and, and we're looking for inspiration. We look at things going on overseas, things in Botswana, things in China, things in Venezuela, things in Kazakhstan, things in, you know, like what's going on in Armenia. Like, you know, we do a lot of on the ground work or, or high level analysis of those things. Again, trying to build up the the just clear understanding of the world that we're going to need to even understand what kind of world we live in, what kind of world we want to build, uh, what kinds of techniques are out there being deployed, that kind of stuff. I think that is really the primary uh, activity of of building up that new worldview and, and then, therefore, the new uh, governing consensus, hopefully. So, yeah, so that that's that's a response just to something just just uh, I wanted to add that basically to what you said at the start and. Um, yeah. Additionally, I think I think you're spot on with just kind of us wanting to build uh, a new consensus of of essentially bringing more responsibility into this game, bringing more seriousness into it, um, and and building up that new generation of of statesmen potentially, and and building something that can inform them, can inspire them, can craft new visions. And so so yeah, like I just wanna I just wanna. I want to focus on that, that basically that core point of Palladium is, is building up that new worldview, right? That's what we focus on here. The, the other stuff all comes in time. We're focusing uh, at the beginning on building up the new worldview, because I think that is really the, the crux of the issue. Excellent. And you recently wrote a kind of overview piece on what is arguably the, the the key kind of guiding concept or theme of Palladium, which is this mm -hmm. idea of governance futurism. Uh, you recently wrote this article, which I'll link to in the show notes for anyone who wants to go read it. And you, you basically kind of look back at some of the best previous work of Palladium and you try to basically give your own diagnosis of, of what's really at stake and where, where Palladium is really headed, what it's really all about. Mm -hmm. And one of the, one of the ideas that jumps out to me in that piece that I found most interesting is that, um, I think at, at about you know three quarters of the way through, you talk about the concept of a network of seed institutions, and yes. 
I thought that this was very interesting and compelling. It, it jives quite well with, with some of the ideas I have and some of the stuff I've been writing about and, and actually building in my own way. So I wonder if we could zero in on that for a moment. And I, I would love to hear you expand a little bit on that because I think it, it might resonate most with my audience. Um, what What is this concept of, of a network of seed institutions? Just expand on yeah. that a bit, if you would. Yeah, sure. Okay, I think I need to give a little bit of context on, on the rest of the argument to really understand what we're saying there. So... Um, yeah, I mean, the rest of the argument, as we've said, is, is first of all, laying out kind of what I've already laid out, right? We have this crisis, we need a new institutional generation, we need new ideas, and we need, we need actually not just new ideas, but, but new institutions, new people. And so this is kind of, I'm, I'm putting forth our longer term vision, right? And, and then the question is, how do we actually get there from here? And where is everything going? How do these things actually work historically? Um, so there's sort of this, this kind of, I don't know if it's a debate or what, but there's this tension in the discourse right now of, of sort of people on the one hand who expect everything's crashing, you know, the, the regime is screwed. Our country is screwed. Like this is no going nowhere good. And people who expect like, oh yeah, we can turn this around with, with this or that intervention. Um, and at Palladium, we're actually kind of agnostic about that, but we synthesize them in an interesting way, which is, I think that the current order is not going to survive. I think it is way too kind of over its head in in and doubled down in its, its system of decline, basically. But um, if you take an analogy to a natural ecosystem you often you know you have a mature ecosystem a forest or something there's some big tree that's dominating things everything's really oriented around that but it's rotting out at the core well it falls over and it creates room for all these new things these seeds to grow up um around it and and so really like the the way we're thinking about it you can't you can't use any particular analogy very strongly here but basically the way we're thinking about it is there's probably going to be a crisis over the next while, maybe some, maybe over the next decade, a, a, a decade of chaos is is a term we've thrown around. Um, but out of that, new things can grow, and so we're talking about seeds. We need to be laying the groundwork. We need to be laying out the seeds now. We need to be thinking about what kinds of institutions are going to be growing up in that new environment um, that can become the new order that comes after. And so it's really just this kind of uh, taking the evolution of, of civilizations and applying sort of this gardening ethos to it, like, hey, how can we accelerate the return to um, to some functional order? So seed institutions are these institutions that maybe are very small right now. Maybe they're very obscure, but they're probably going to have currency among young people. They're going to have currency among smart people, among early adopters. Um, they're going to be positioning themselves uh, in ways that are robust to to systemic disruption and and maybe are even anti fragile, and and those institutions are going to become really the next generation of institutions as um, you know what you kind of characterize as the boomer gerontocracy ages out. Um, it, it's basically inevitable, right? Like they they are, they are failing succession and they're not going to live forever. So we have to be building something. So seed institutions is this key concept that we added. Um, yeah. So what does that look like? So Palladium is trying to be a seed institution in the area of political theory. Um, there are other things going on. There's, I, I'm not going to characterize any particular institution this way because I'm not, I don't want to like you know, speak too much about or speak too closely about what what someone else is doing. But there are other projects around that are, I think, positioning themselves strategically in this way. And the way I see this going, you know, when I talked about a network of seed institutions, the way I see this going is that over the coming years, as as the situation develops, as these institutions develop, there's going to be more explicit self-identification of this trend and people identifying each other as being the same kind of thing and building ties and trying to build up the new consensus, the new normal, the the new order, even if it's sort of nascent, even if it's in this sort of seed mode, I think as it establishes itself, it, it will uh, build more and more relationships among that. And out of that will be um, sort of uh, the new optimism that hopefully can come out of all of this. So I, I think 
Um, I'd love to kind of continue to go into this topic. I, I don't know if that answers the question or not, but I, I just wanted to give that overview of the concept, where it's coming from. It's really coming from this kind of like ecosystem analogy applied to the fate of civilizations uh, in our in our current historical moment. I think basically one way to see this is we're in autumn. We need to be pulling back the leaves. We need to be planting seeds. We need to be preparing for winter, but then also spring. All right. All right. Yeah, no, that's perfect. That That's a that's a great high high level overview. And we'll spend most of this conversation in one way or another unpacking that and and drawing out the different threads of that. In fact, I think before we move on to do that, I think what would be really good to do at this point in the conversation is hear a little bit about the backstory of Palladium as a project uh, more concretely. So if you could, because people in my audience are very interested in how people nowadays are creating all these new types of models for both sustaining long-term intellectual work, but also that are um, deeply independent and that have a unique and an authentic vision and the ways that people are nowadays experimenting with making that function in a way that's sustainable, both economically, but also politically. And so it seems like Palladium is, is a, has a really interesting, uh, you know, success case in a way you, you've carved out mm -hmm. an interesting little model. And I know you have some ideas around the importance of nonprofit structures. So mm -hmm. I just want to hear a little bit about, um, concretely, like just give us the basic backstory. How did Palladium emerge? What was the, what was the kind of founding story yeah. there? And give us a sense of like, who were the players, the stakeholders and, and the, the model or the, or the, the, the logic of, of the operation as it's been designed as a functioning, um, you know, you know, um, whether you want to call it a community, it's not quite a business, a community, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, just help, help us understand, like, what is the model, um, concretely and kind of how did it emerge? Tell us the story of the, of the actors, yeah. the stakeholders. Yeah. I'll just tell you the story from the beginning. So, or, you know, at some arbitrary point, obviously not the beginning of time, <laughs> but, but basically I'd say sometime around, let's say 2015, um, I was building up a network of friends who were independent intellectuals trying to think about how the world works, trying to understand things and who had really zeroed in on this governance problem that, that we've been talking about. Um, and, and we, we were doing a lot of work. We were doing a lot of research together, just trying to understand the thing, build up our ideas. We knew that ideas are important. We knew that it's, you know, we're going to need these ideas. We're going to need to build a network around this. So that's what we had been doing. And, and over time, as that developed and, and as we sort of got ourselves into more and more positions with, with career and connections and, and just our thoughts on the world as things developed, we realized, okay, what we need is a publication to put these ideas forward um and and that was that actually we went into that in a very open-ended way we thought okay we need some kind of institution that is going to be the center of this make this sustainable make this grow make this influential and and we thought through what are the things that that we could use for that and and we settled on a magazine because a magazine allows us to put forth a lot of you know, experimental, but also relatively polished intellectual content. It allows us to gather a community around itself um, that that will be intellectually and ideologically motivated by the, the work we're doing. It'll allow us to to network on behalf of the project. You know, we can go around and say, hey, we're with Palladium magazine. This is what we do. This is what we're thinking. Um, so it, it's sort of this this center. Also, of course, it allows us to uh, have, have sort of a center of funding for, for the intellectual project. And, and then of course the discourse center, the actual intellectual center. So it, it ended up being this, this, uh, great model for what we wanted to do. So we settled on a magazine, we launched in 2018 and, and, um, since the beginning, we've kind of had this concept. Now this hasn't been explicit the whole time, but we've definitely had the concept the whole time, which is luxury political theory. And the idea is we're sort of mating this this very exploratory, fun kind of adventurous um, approach to political theory with um, a, a level of polish and eliteness and luxury and and uh, just just kind of um, 
this this was especially apparent in our in-person parties and so on that we put a lot of effort into the aesthetic of the thing we put a lot of effort into making sure that people were you know dressing well and uh coming coming to really like take the thing up a level socially and so we really wanted to build something that that felt uh that felt really good and looked really good and had had uh, the potential to have prestige so so this was this concept of luxury political theory and so we've developed it over time and and the model is you know a combination of this kind of high level analysis um where we you know take something happening in the world and we really drill into that and and try to understand it from an intellectual perspective try to synthesize whatever insights it has into our ongoing kind of worldview project we combine that also with on the ground journalism you know adventurism we send someone out uh, to Xinjiang, Venezuela, you know, Kazakhstan, Ukraine. These are a bunch of the ex- expeditions we've done over the last few years. And um, and we get them to just what's going on, what's on the ground. Let's let's just see what's happening there. Get the good information, get the navigation grade information about what's happening in the world. Um, and and say, and then we bring that back. And again, we run it through sort of this analysis and synthesis uh, into our worldview, so the, the really at the core of it, there's this this kind of intellectual research program that that I think um, sounds like it would be appealing to to kind of your audience. The, w- the way you guys think about this is you're trying to sustain um, intellectual activity and independent intellectual activity. That's definitely what we're doing. And then so there's this question of okay, what is the model by which this actually gets funded, right? So we're doing all this great stuff. How do you actually fund it? Um, so we launched as a nonprofit, and the reason for that is, first of all, that all projects like this essentially lose money. They are delivering a sort of abstract public good, or you know, maybe maybe it's like in some of the more cynical cases, kind of like propaganda in, impact or whatever. But it's essentially you're building an abstract public good. It's not something that's necessarily excludable. It's not something that that. Um, that is this this sort of um, sharp benefit to anyone in particular, and, and especially that excludable parameter is is uh, you know very hard to do with information. So we thought, okay, let's double down on that. Let's let and and for this reason, actually, almost all publications lose money, or you know, in the sense that they're not making a profit from from putting up their stuff. They're doing it for other reasons. People buy into it for other reasons. They buy into it to to sustain the thing, to get control of it, to you know, whatever. Um, and so we thought, okay, this this has to be a nonprofit because that is the honest and correct distillation of what's actually going on here. And that's the first reason. The second reason is as we grow this thing as as a project that that is to have uh, some prestige and is to have some some um, you know, an established community around it that really wants to support it as as an almost uh, meta political project. We don't want it to be bogged down with um, you know investors or or sort of this this very very kind of commercial orientation to it. We want it to be very much focused on that intellectual side. So we launched as a nonprofit. This also obviously gives all these pa- tax benefits for the people who are giving us money and and for ourselves. Um, now, where does the money actually come from? Who gives the money? Why sustain this kind of um, intellectual work? There's the, the big core of it is this is something we launched recently. We started with some seed funding, but what, what we launched recently is our luxury political theory print magazine, Palladium. Uh, we launched Palladium 1 earlier this year. In the summer, we're doing Palladium 2. So that's this, uh, you know, what we consider to be a very beautiful and luxurious polished product presenting our work in the best possible light and um, for for basically the, the best possible uh, reader experience. You know, you get your Palladium magazine, you take it to the park, you read it. It's really nice. Um, it's the best way to read Palladium. And, and we give that as a perk to people who are supporting us. So people sign up on our on our Patreon or or on our uh yeah, basically, or or otherwise, kind of are, are supporting us, and then we send them this magazine in in response, and and so that kind of builds us this this core uh, audience, or or that that helps kind of 
reinforce this core audience. But really, the, the idea we had since the beginning of the project was because this is an ideological project, because we're building sort of an ideological movement almost, we are going to be building a dedicated community that is willing to support this. And, and the magazine is part of that. The podcast is part of that. But really, the main model here is that we have this dedicated ideological community that really wants to pitch in and really wants to support the project because they see what we're doing. They're on board with what we're doing. They see the value of kind of applying our energy collectively to this particular problem in society. And so the, the model is, yeah, it's a nonprofit. We do care a lot about making sure it's sustainable through kind of having this audience support. And the main model is, as we do a good job, we will build up an ideologically dedicated audience that believes in the project and they will be willing to support us, um, as, including in response to, to some of these perks like the magazine. It's an interesting approach and, and, it, and it's, it's compelling. It's basically what you're saying is start by biting the bullet that this is intrinsically a nonprofit thing. It's probably not going to make a million dollars. So that way you're not, you know, running around telling investors Hey, this is going to make you a million dollars. Please invest in us, which is, as you said, a kind of for this type of project, it would just feel dishonest. And I like that you, you say that you start with honesty, just look, yeah. most, most publications don't make money, but publication seems to be the best way to do what we're doing. So bite that bullet. It's a nonprofit. It's probably not going to make a lot of money, but make it really high quality, go all in on quality and go all in on, on coherence and mission. And then pretty much just go around to people who are interested in that mission coming to fruition and just basically ask them to yeah. be a part of it and to support it financially. But then also to, in a second stage, layer on a, a, a layer that does involve revenue generation in a way yeah. that is well, and uh, it's, consistent with your goals. Yeah. And it's in, in fact, it's like it's directly, directly tied into our goals, right? Like it, part of what we're trying to do is build a new ideological constituency, right? We're, we're trying to build a new worldview, which means, well, it starts out with almost no one believes or thinks this way, right? And we have to get them over that hump. We have to start putting out the knowledge, putting out our analysis in a way that can, can you know, if people are, they see what we're doing, they see the value, they can actually start to think that way because we've actually done the work to establish, okay, look, here's our worldview. Um, and, and so that means, yeah, you're inherently starting out a little bit small. Um, but as you are developing that, you're also developing that constituency that's willing to, to go in on this. And so it's, it's, and that's very much our core mission, right? Our core mission is to grow the number and quality of people who believe in a new and, and better way of thinking. And so we have to build that and then we have to gather those people around us and and then yeah and so the it's just kind of from a business perspective at least it's just like you you take a little bit off the top of that fundamental growth that you're trying to trying to uh create and and yeah so exactly uh right on with the honesty point i i think we we place a very high uh value on on honesty and and this is this is also somewhat necessary to the project i think like one way to one way we have characterized what we're doing is actually just taking a much more honest approach about what's actually going on in politics and and what what sort of is necessary to do in in governance um and and that doesn't you know that's obviously there are um political challenges with you know full uh, radical honesty so we're not going you know all the way to like we're going to say everything but but we think that when we hit an issue, when we analyze something, the 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 real superpower is is just let's let's sort of put all the hype and spin and and ideology aside, put all the moralism aside, and just say, okay, honestly, from a clear perspective, what's going on here? How do we understand it? If we were approaching this as someone who's trying to kind of use clarity as their their sort of secret weapon in in understanding in, in, in how to approach the world how would we approach this issue and so that that is really actually one of the core values not just from a business perspective but intellectually yeah absolutely it's an interesting insight i think i think people listening will will appreciate this if they think about it because there is there really is a trade-off between truth telling and 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 profit seeking 
there, I mean, there always has been. And I think especially in today's world where, you know, there's so much venture capital slushing around and everyone's got some big, crazy, ambitious business idea, because if you have some big, crazy, ambitious business idea, it's not that hard to get, you know, some, 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 some capital. Um, but that it really does create these, uh, these pressures on you that are not fully consistent with just seeking the absolute truth and figuring out things in an intellectual way. So I think, I think it's a smart, I think it's an interesting and compelling move to go all in on a kind of nonprofit, uh, model. But then once you have that base functioning to come up with, uh, with some revenue generating, um, mechanisms that are, that are consistent with what you're doing, but do, it, the key being, you never have to go around to people claiming to be something that you're not, or claiming to offer profits or claiming to, to sell things. Like you just have to have a clear mission, really, really good ideas. And then you need, um, to basically just find the people who like those things and value them and want to support them. So I, I think that this is, this is, a, uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting insight that, that you've, you've kind of come on and, and, mm -hmm. and, and built, built the organization around. Yeah. Okay, I, so, I just want to respond to one, one final thing before we move on to another yeah. question. Um, yeah, you, you said sort of there's, there's a divide between truth telling and, and profit making. I think that can very much be true at particular times in history, in a particular context. Um, and, and, and certainly at, at a time in history like this, I think. Um, when when uh, sort of our discourse is, is degrading in quality and, and, and controls. However, I just want to make the kind of, I don't know, almost metaphysical point that actually, uh, like part of the reason I really do believe in honesty is in the long term, I think honesty is a reflection of consciousness. It's a reflection of, of clarity of consciousness, coherence of how things in your, in your world are relating to each other. It's it's signals getting where they need to go in a coherent sense. And that is really the big superpower behind life, behind intelligence, behind all kinds of civilizational progress. And so it, it really is like like I do see that that growth in, in kind of honesty and consciousness as being actually very fundamental to to uh, the growth of life, the growth of, of civilization, etc. Um, and, and so I just want to make that point that I, I do believe those things are very much aligned in the long run, but there are particular times in history where, where, uh, you know, it's not necessarily marginally aligned, but the fundamental is aligned. I think that's a great point. That's a very welcome, uh, bit of nuance there. And I, I mean, as someone who's personally building a for-profit machinery to do, to do my own, uh, independent intellectual work, I, I, I'm very much appreciate the point and completely agree. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a good wrinkle to add for sure. I just think it's interesting the the different trade offs involved, and um, I, I do just see the logic of of starting off with a nonprofit yeah. um, uh, proposition. Basically, there, there there are real benefits to that um, intellectually, and I was just kind of flagging that. So mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for adding that nuance. All right, so I'd love to talk now a little bit more about the, the the big ideas that are circulating in Palladium. I think that gives people a good sense of of what Palladium is, how it functions, and and how you all have built this unique machinery to sustain yourselves and also to, um, you know, hopefully in the long run have the larger impacts that you want to have. So I'd love to now unpack a little bit some of the some of the themes that revolve around governance futurism. And specifically, a lot of people today are talking about things like charter cities or cloud countries or the network state. You have, people might have heard of uh, all of these terms, and it seems to be definitely an, an idea that's in the air, both intellectually, but also in terms of startups. Uh, there, there are lots of people who are just thinking in this direction. It, it, to me, it rhymes a lot with the, the, the Palladium vision. It rhymes a lot with governance futurism. And I think it is something that you, you have been paying attention to and, and, you, and you, you've, you've been thinking about. So I'm curious when you look at this moment and all of the different projects out there that are trying to work on something like this, for people listening, all I'm referring to is basically what it all revolves around is some vision of um, basically creating new forms of sovereignty that that kind of somehow emerge from whether it's the internet or crypto or it's it's this kind of uh, meme or vision that a lot of people have where digital technology seems like it's hitting a critical mass where new forms of sovereignty are going to emerge. Um, so instead of you know 
taking over the U.S. government and making it better. It's more like there is this mental model a lot of people have where just new forms of 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 exit, new forms of 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 uh, micro political structures will emerge and grow, and maybe that's going to be the thing that that changes the world or solves our governance problems. What's I I know you have some some thoughts on this. Like, what do you see as the how do you diagnose this? Like, do you, is this promising? Do you think that these projects are, are there, are any of these going to succeed or are you more bearish on it? Yeah. So this is a great question. Um, it, you know, as you correctly identify, I think palladium kind of comes from that milieu, uh, at least sort of demographically a lot of those people are just our friends. Um, and, and, and so, and, and a lot of the impulses behind that are very much shared, right? That, that That's all coming out of kind of seeing the problems with the current order, seeing the decay, seeing the need for something new, seeing the, pow- the power of, of kind of more futuristic t- type of thinking, seeing the power of paradigm shifts, all this stuff very much shared with us, very much coming out of that same milieu. That said, we are very, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty contrarian in this space, at, at least. I think we're not very contrarian relative to kind of overall, you know, historical thought. But um, but basically, like early on, we we criticized charter cities that we, we had an article, not that it was a bad idea, but it, that it won't produce decentralized government. It won't be producing the new government modes. So on charter cities in particular, our thesis was basically these things are done on territory. They are done by territorial states. They need the backing of territorial states. They will be done for the purposes of territorial states, especially the big ones that are more secure in their political order so that they're able to do these kinds of experiments. So and that's why, you know, nine times out of 10, the things that look like charter cities are being done by China, right? Um, the things that are cited as these examples of like, oh, look, they're doing this, you know, kind of legally, uh, you know, special economic zone or, or some new project or something. It's, it's nine times out of 10, there's something, some project by China. Um, it's because China is a big territorial state that wants to be doing experiments for its own purposes. And, and so we sort of had that thesis is like, look, guys, don't forget the fundamentals here. Power is the fundamentals, power and empires. And, and that really is what drives history. So, um, yeah. And then, and then on, on things like, you know, decentralized network states, uh, crypto, the internet, all that stuff. I mean, again, like we're very optimistic about where these things can go, what they can do. But again, we take this this sort of um, contrarian point of view there. It's like, no, actually, the internet is not going to lead to um, this decentralization, a political decentralization. It's not going to lead to a lot of uh, to a new form of sovereignty that's smaller. In fact, it's going to lead to a new form of sovereignty that's much bigger and more centralized. Like this is the major effect of what's happening with the internet is actually that everything becomes more legible to established bureaucracies, to established power networks. And, um, you know, I think people think a little bit clearer when they look at China uh, about these things. Is China going to be decentralized because of the internet? Well, no, it's not. They, they definitely have a handle on it. And they know how to manage public discourse. They are learning how to manage public discourse. They run, uh, you know, people are often accusing them of, of running this big surveillance state. It's very repressive, et cetera, et cetera. I think this is just um, people um, having clarity about what the Internet fundamentally is and and uh, having some anxiety about that. But I don't think that's different Um between China and let's say the West, I think the same fundamentals are playing out in the West. What we're seeing is more homogenization of discourse, more control of discourse, editorial control from the top level, um, more total volume of discourse, more perhaps even functionality of discourse. There's more voices happening, more things possible, more people are able to talk to each other than before, but also the thing is more managed. Um, And so I really think that all these new technologies, and, and this analysis actually transfers over to many other kind of technological um, new, new things happening in technology. It, it um, Basically, I expect that a lot of this stuff is, is mostly going to be centralizing. Um, that said, I think it will also probably disrupt the current models that we have of governance. Most of those obviously formed for the TV era and the... Um, you know, the, the, the pre like for an era before um, 
sort of modern internet powered marketing. I think I think the previous sort of era definitely was formed with with marketing, which which was a an example of this previously. And, it, and everyone, I think, recognizes that it, it did homogenize things. But I think that's with with internet powered marketing, it's going to go a level further and um, and we're going to get new forms of political power out of that. But the actual result is larger and more powerful empires, not smaller and less powerful empires. Interesting. And, okay. And then, yeah, I, I mean, if, you, if you'll if let me keep going, I, I, I have uh, also a response on this question of like uh, sort of decentralized network states or, or non-states, kind of sovereign collectives, ideas like that. Um, I think uh, something I've brought up here previously before is, is I think those things are possible. There are good examples of them. For example, I, I think the Ismaili Muslims uh, I've brought up previously, and they have diplomatic relations as uh, you know a quasi-state entity. They have they have their people are um, very much bought into this big network that they have. They have businesses. They have they have a whole kind of economic empire. They have a political empire. They have their own philanthropic empires. They have all kinds of stuff going on. They're spread across many different countries, um, but they are a religion. And I think that's something that people need to appreciate is that at that level of sort of rarefaction of your of your network state, you need some new force that's holding it together. And I think in in this case, it's, um, you know, they have they, they're very dedicated to some particular, you know, quasi ethnic um religious identity and and that that can really bind something together i think without that if it's just kind of um you know particular modes of economic interaction that they're using i think what happens is if that works it rapidly takes over the world and everyone uses it and if it doesn't work well it doesn't work so out of crypto for example in these these sort of crypto network states um there may be things that happen especially temporarily in this sort of decentralized uh, internet sovereignty sense. But I think in the long term, it either becomes the new empire or it fails. Fascinating, fascinating. So you seem to believe that the any serious project in governance futurism needs to A, go through the United States, and B, that it should focus on elite level reform. So... I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit and and explain and explain not only why why you think that, but realistically and concretely, like what it would look like. Because in some ways, when you, when you when I listen to you talk, it it almost sounds a little bit like what you're describing would be something like a more traditional think tank. So I start to wonder, like, why is Palladium not a, a beautiful office building in Washington D.C. that is just whispering into the ears of 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 D.C. politicians? And so, so what, why are you not doing that? What's the problem with that model? If what you're interested in is elite level reform and you believe in basically whispering, whispering into the ear of the American empire, like what's unique and new about the palladium, uh, vision of how this actually mm -hmm. unfolds. Yeah. All in good time, Justin, uh, <laughs> you know, w with respect to fancy office buildings, but is that um, the game plan? Like in the long what, term, is that where you see this going or no? Or is it something? Yeah. In a way, let, let, let's, uh, let's really get into this. And I, I think yeah. this is a great question. Um, yeah, so so you mentioned two things, basically the U.S. government and elite level reform. So these are bets that we're making. Uh, we think that America is not going away on a short term. It's going to continue to be one of the most powerful governments in the world. It it has sort of multiple cycles of reform left in the tank, um, and and there will not be sort of anything like a easy escapes from it. I think people have all these ideas of exit, you know, okay, we'll go to Singapore, we'll go to somewhere in Africa, you know, set up some new thing um, that that won't have to be beholden to what goes on in the New York Times and in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, I wish those people plenty of good luck. They're going to need it because the long arm of USG is very long and um, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it doesn't quite work like that. It basically a lot of those places are only sort of available to you even because of U.S. influence in those areas. Otherwise, they would be something very different. Um, it, you know, there's not a lot of maybe people will move to China, move to Russia, move to Iran. That's that's maybe a more realistic option. But I think it's it's, you know, being more realistic. It's 
uh, harder to fantasize about. Um, and anyway, so, th- so there's this question of the U.S. I think the U.S. is the center of the empire. It's going to remain the center of, of a huge fraction of the world's empire um, for a, a long time yet. And, and there are cycles of reform left in the tank in the U.S. So then the question is, why elite? why it's sort of uh, uh, an elite transformation. And and this one, I think we have to add a little bit of nuance. Um, It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, the current boomer gerontocracy is going to change their mind. Uh, I think that's kind of impossible. Um, It's also, you know, suppose you did that. Well, good luck. You know, okay, you've changed your mind, but, you know, in 10 years, it's going to be someone different, right? So, So I think it's more like, you have this established political order in the Western world. And I, I mean this in the, the loosest possible sense rather than a strong sense. Um, there are just kind of institutions, lines of trust, um, particular families, particular people, particular demographics that have a lot of power um, and and a lot of just the structure of society. I think that kind of stuff mostly is going to stay intact through whatever reforms the U.S. is faced with. That also means whoever's currently powerful, broadly speaking, is going to, broadly speaking, continue to be powerful. And that means those people, um, that that sort of elite that's currently associated with the American regime, um, not not necessarily like the the particular officers or the particular, uh, you know, most powerful people, but, but broadly speaking, I think we, we must expect a lot of continuity there. Now, this is this is not something that, you know, I'm I'm sort of predicting in a vacuum. If you look at the vast majority of social changes throughout history, it looks like this. You you know, even things as radical and 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 uh, deliberate as sort of the Chinese um, communist revolution. Well, a lot of the families that were powerful before that. Oh, look, they ended up still being powerful after that. Um, and, and in a lot of the cases, it's like their kids that are doing doing the revolution and uh, stuff like that. So even in the most disruptive examples, you get this continuity. Um, and and so I think I think the key a, a, another key idea from history that we have to bring in here is that most of the time when you really cherry, chase the influences, how did these things happen? What happened? It's coming because of initiatives at the elite level there are there are maybe a failing faction of elites and a rising faction of elites and the rising faction is sort of pulling off this maybe popular looking revolution against the failing faction but it really is is this uh, elite politics that that is going on there that actually um, drives the thing and so at some point you have to be talking about people at that very, you know, disproportionately high power level. You're not talking about kind of a bunch of uh, sort of random middle class people um, forming some new regime. That That's actually not where new regimes come from ever. Um, so, so I think that's sort of the, just this historical background that you must understand if you're, if you're going to be thinking about what kinds of social transformations are possible. And, and so when we think about it, we think, okay, look, we're not trying to rock the boat here. We're not trying to be disruptive. We do see a certain amount of disruption baked into the pie already. And like, we're going to have to be honest about that. But um, the people with the most leverage uh, are, are, you know, broadly speaking, the ruling class. And, and if those people have the ideas that they have currently, well, the American, the American empire is not going to be doing very well for very long. Um, and if they can have new ideas, they have changed their mind in the past. Obviously, you know, it, it involves some level of circulation, especially of officials and so on like like this. But but new ideas do come in and 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 reformat things at the elite level. And I think that's just the way these transformations happen historically. And and um, for various reasons, we must expect it to go this way in America. Um, you know, we're, I don't think we're going to be conquered from outside, whatever, you know, there's all these other options, but none of those are really relevant to us. What's really relevant is, is we're going to be seeing an elite driven transformation. So we have aimed ourselves with palladium at let's build up ideas that are 
fit to be operating at that elite level. Let's try to build up ideas that are responsible enough, really aimed at that, not like, oh, you know, we're whining about the elite or, you know, we're opposing the elite from a sort of populist perspective. It's, it's the first task that we have set ourselves is let's, let's conceive of an alternate eliteness. What would it mean to be elite, to even be continuous with the current elite and the current worldview, but be a fundamentally new worldview that doesn't have the same problems? And that's so that's the approach we have taken. That is a bet we have taken. Maybe there's other things that are going to work out there, but that's the bet we are taking. Um, I think it's a fairly sound bet. And and yeah, so that's how we see things. And then I can also answer your question on, you know, well, well hey, guys, why aren't you in D.C. then? Um, I think I think D.C. culture is part of the problem. Um, and basically, if you're going in there and setting up a think tank in D.C., you're rapidly going to end up um, sort of digested into D.C. cultural norms, D.C. political norms, D.C. institutional networks. And and I think you don't want to do that at this stage. Um, I think I think, you know, people try to start things in in D.C. I don't think that works. I think what happens in D.C. is this uh, it's it's the the nuts and bolts, kind of the machine operators of the current regime. Well, we need to be thinking about the new regime. So that's why we're in San Francisco and California broadly, um, though not immediately right now due to COVID, but that's sort of our base, our social base, our, our kind of uh, demographic base is, is much more like West Coast. We actually see that as where the dynamic new ideas, the dynamic new networks are going to be coming from. And um, I think basically you want a space where you can incubate something new, especially at these early stages. And so we are focused overwhelmingly on incubating something new rather than influencing, uh, you know, what currently exists. I, I, that, that all, you know, if that happens, that's way later. We're just focused on building something new that can become influential. Um, and and I, it, I think that's an important distinction. Right. I, I like this model in that, what you're proposing really is kind of neither exit nor voice, or it's almost a kind of strategic sequencing of them. As I listen to you, it sounds to me, it's kind of like, on the one hand, you're like, yeah, step out of these extremely corrupt and dying institutions to gain some freedom and flexibility to actually think clearly and build something real and fundamentally new, but only really do that with an eye towards gaining power and influence that then filters back in as voice and and revivifies the institutions. Is that a fair way to link your ideas to this kind of classical distinction between exit and voice? Yeah. I mean, I don't think about things in those terms um, just because I think like, you know, most exit is fake. I, you know, there's real exit where like the regime is totally out to get you and some other regime is welcoming you and like, you know, you flee. But um but I think like most of the time it's, it's kind of fake. Um, and, and voice, you know, there's, there's actually just this huge continuum of tactics and strategies that you can deploy. But yeah, I think, I think broadly it's like, you don't want to be right in the soup right now. Uh, you don't want to be tied into the current order, but you do want to be broadly like we do actually want to be aligned with the american empire right the american empire is our home the american empire is our society um this is sort of who we are and where we come from and and the place that is likely to be the most interesting force for a positive future for the foreseeable future um it's just that right now it's in a bad state so you don't want to be right in the in the sort of um you know, right in the boiler room when it's on fire, so to speak, but you want to be somewhere else in the thing, making sure that you're still um, working on the overall trajectory of it. So, so yeah, I see it sort of as like, I mean, one way to think about it, actually, that I think is a good, um, I don't know, a counter, a, a counter kind of model to that whole thing. Like that, that, that whole way of thinking sort of presumes like, oh, I'm a powerless uh, oppressed person, like, what do I do? You know, do I exercise my voice or do I leave? Um, I think one way I've liked to think about it is, okay, suppose you're sitting there in the government and you're, you have farsight 
and you see what's happening and you're going to charter some new effort that is going to design uh, the next generation of, of government. So you're sitting there in D.C. and you say like, all right, here's this bill I'm going to sign. This is going to create this new effort that is going to go out. It's going to do intellectual exploration and it's going to come back with a new order. And and it's it's initiated by and for the current establishment. It's going to be disruptive, but it's by and for the, you know, basically America as it stands. And we're sending out this effort. This effort is going to go and operate somewhere else, somewhere quiet, somewhere it doesn't have to deal with the day-to-day nonsense, but it's going to be ultimately coming back with something new. And and so we think about ourselves sort of as this like unofficially official project to reboot the American government um, and the American political paradigm. And and I think you have to sort of take that mindset when to to get out of this idea of like, you know, this is some kind of rebellion or something. It's not right. We're, we're just trying to fix things. Um, and, and we're trying to be as cooperative as possible while we do that. It's just like, yeah, we have to challenge some ideas along the way. But this is actually, you know, we want to think of ourselves as being, you know, again, like an unofficial project of, of like the extended government. Um, so I think... I don't know. I, I, I feel like that's sort of an interesting way to think about it. That's how I think about it sometimes. Um, I just want to offer that as sort of this alternate model. Yeah, that, that's excellent. That's excellent. So I wonder if in kind of the last 10 minutes of this conversation, we could go a little bit more into detail on, well, pretty much two things. The one thing I want to ask you is that you have an engineering background. And so I'm curious when you look at the, the technological landscape, I'm curious what most excites you there just kind of look uh, crypto is an obvious one which we've discussed a little bit but i wonder if there's anything other than crypto that from an engineering perspective you look at on the technical landscape where you're like oh this could be really important for the types of projects that that you're working on and that people in my audience might be working on Mm -hmm. i mean i could answer that question straight i think you know there's some interesting things going on in like ai or whatever i i would sort of characterize it more as scary uh rather than exciting but um i think there's definitely some stuff you know being done but let me flip that around i think the technology is not what needs to be done in the in the world of atoms it's not what it's it's like fundamentally not the bottleneck and it's even even in like the material production area or, or just broadly, like the things we call technology. I don't think actual technology is what we want. Um, I think, I think we haven't effectively used the technology that we have. We are no longer industrializing. We're no longer developing, and, um, and that's you know, like further technology is kind of just this. Um, it's cope. It's it's a thing that allows you to believe that there's a future despite like the overwhelming reality of decline. I think the um the actual place that effort needs to be applied the actual thing that would excite me is like very mundane like let's fix the potholes let's apply high speed rail let's build more trains let's build more transit let's build better infrastructure let's figure out how to actually do software engineering let's like rebuild more of our of our software stack um let's rebuild more of our our industrial stack let's like build up more factories let's just actually be doing the thing uh, not just not just kind of inventing the thing, but doing the thing. And um, so I think that's the thing that excites me is just this like vision of even with 1960s technology, we could be so much further than where we are um, industrially. Like we could be we could be mining metals on on other planets, you know, like like 16 Psyche is solid metal asteroid. Right. It's like we could be mining metals. We could be you know setting up an experimental base on Mars. We could be running you know, much better infrastructure, trains, buildings, um, like much more wonderful cities. There's just so much we could do from this very mundane perspective of like, let's just actually do the development thing. And so that's, I'm just going to say that that's, I think, what excites me um, it is, is like just kind of polishing, polishing the technology that we have, which we're not doing. Okay. So you think that technological innovation is is something of a distraction but you did say that you are interested in 
software engineering and you even mentioned maybe uh you know revisiting the the essence of the of the software stack that defines yes uh, you know contemporary computing so i've noticed that a lot of palladium people are quite interested in urbit or yes. something that i've been increasingly kind of interested in and i've actually become somewhat somewhat more bullish on on urbit i actually think it's more interesting and more compelling than than a lot of people appreciate i think people are kind of sleeping on urbit so is is urbit possibly interesting from the governance futurist perspective or what's your take on urbit if you have one yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I can comment from governance futurism, but well, I don't know, maybe, maybe. Yeah, let, let's go for it. OK, um, I think, yeah, the big problem in the big problem in software is like we have this fundamental sort of ball of mud, as as Curtis Yarbin called it, that that is this pile of junky software that just keeps piling up and we don't know how to get we don't know how to like compress it. We don't know how to make it nice again. And it just keeps getting worse. I think Jonathan Blow has also had some very good commentary on this problem, um, and 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 like the software ecosystem in some sense is out of control. And this isn't a technology problem. It's like you know, there's almost too much technology. It's it's like an organization problem, and and um, I think Urbit is a really interesting project in that it's tackling that core problem and it's saying, all right, look. We're going to do this kind of, you know, paradigm reboot operation that we're trying with Palladium, but we're going to do it in in um, in software. We're going to just go and wipe the slate clean, you know, learn all the lessons that we've learned, but forget all the all the particular pieces of infrastructure and and sort of uh, best practices and so on. Build up a new computing stack with new ideas and. Um, Urbit may or may not work in that, but I think it's very exciting that that kind of thing is being done. I think that kind of thing should be done. Urbit has this, I think it's got a great model in terms of how the networking works, how the identities work, how, uh, and, 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 you know, ideally not depending on, on, you know, so much of the current software stack, if those things could actually be pulled off, that's huge. Um, and and so I think, yeah, it's it's very exciting. And I think it, it fits with what I'm saying of like, yeah, there's some new technology there, but it's kind of incidental to the actual organizational project, which I see as more primary. And and like what needs to be done in software is not like new whiz bang algorithms. It's it's just, uh, you know, in some cases those will come up. It's just this like, let's actually go and develop something better something with what we know uh, a better way of organizing things and just actually do the job. And I think, yeah, so Urbit is a great example of that. Um, I'm occasionally on Urbit. Um, it hasn't sort of hit its killer app moment for me yet, so I'm not fully on Urbit, but I think it's a cool project. But I think, um, yeah, again, on the question of like technology and whether technology is a distraction, I think technology follows from industrial development rather than leading it as much. I think it's much more like the actual idea of industry is taking the organizational forms we have and just optimizing them and improving them and and working on them and just doing that continuous improvement thing on our whole society um, and, and all the little kind of productive parts of it. And what comes out of that is plenty of new technologies, but also the material foundations for new technologies and all that. So I think... I think the focus on technology uh, is is misplaced. I think that we will get technological acceleration if we got industrial acceleration. I think that, like, I don't think that technology development should stop or whatever. I think technology is great. But I just think that focus on technology development actually is misplaced. And what you actually want to be focusing on is just the holistic development. Um, and yeah, so Urbit, I think, is part of this in the software area. Um, I'd love to see more projects like it. Excellent. Okay, great. So I think my final question would just be to return briefly to to this vision of the network of seed institutions, which, like I said, was kind of the the part of the of your recent essay that most jumped out at me and kept kind of uh, ringing in my mind because I find it quite compelling. And I want to kind of drill down a little bit though uh, before we wrap this up in maybe trying to articulate with you for the audience on concretely how we think this kind of thing would play out specifically with an eye towards the other people out there who are listening to this right now who are working on their own 
paradigm reboot of X, right? And they're thinking, oh, this, this resonates. This sounds what I, this is like a, a similar kind of mental model I've had for large scale kind of American revivification, but they're thinking concretely, you know, okay, cool. Wolf and the Palladium gang are working on this. Cool. Justin's working on this, but what do I do next? Like, what really do I do to, to, to both develop my project, but specifically to feed into and to participate into this into this network of seed institutions. And it's something I'm thinking a lot about myself as well, because it's like, you know, I have my own brand. I have my own project. I have my own machine. You, you have your own, you know, everyone nowadays has their own personal brand. Every organization and, and, and community has its own brand. Right. And so I'm just trying to think through with you concretely, how, how these things bubble up and aggregate in a way that, that increases the power of, of everyone and has the kind of uh, impactful, um, uh, consequences that I think we all want to have in revivifying and, and a kind of overturning this, this really just dead kind of corrupt status quo landscape. So I'm just curious if you have any particular insights around, um, like what people are sleeping on or what they're not paying enough attention to, and what is going to be the key from your perspective to making these different individual brands and projects actually connect up into this, this, you know, network of seed institutions that is actually going to reviv revivify America. Yeah, I mean, so, okay, the first point I will bring up is that you need to format your strategy in a way that is going to kind of be able to grow under the current regime, but flourish under the next. And, and that's, I think, that's like that fundamental fact about a seed, right? A seed is like, it can grow, it can survive, it can take root, but then it really takes off once it gets that opportunity. And you're sort of betting on the future existence of that opportunity. I think that's like the first kind of strategic point. How that actually plays out is going to be, you know, depend on your particulars, um, depend on the particular institutions. But I think like that's that first point is just like make sure you're playing the right strategy. Do you actually believe that there is going to be some new, that there is going to be a coherent particular future? Are you going to be prepared for that? Is there going to be some particular order that you are going to incorporate yourself into or are you seeing yourself as some kind of permanent outsider or something? Um, so that's the first point. Um, so the second point I think is import substitution. So if we imagine this kind of network of seed institutions, it has to become more coherent and more self-sufficient over time. And right now it depends existentially. We all depend existentially on a huge amount of infrastructure that is failing. And, and that's everything from social infrastructure, spiritual infrastructure, um, you know, obviously physical infrastructure, like can you get gas at the gas station uh, this week? But um, there's all kinds of things where, it's, where we are dependent on what we actually know to be threatened. And, and you certainly, and you don't want to be tightly tied into that. Like one of the ways that civilizations fail is they get too um, interdependent and too fragile. If something breaks, everything breaks, right? And you don't want to be partaking in that. You want to get out of that loop. And that means basically um, building out your own, uh, your own supply lines. And now, obviously, building out your own supply lines is like absurdly expensive. So you want to do it in response to the strategic needs and uh, where it makes sense and in conjunction with other people. So so it's just like we need like people need to be identifying what are the institutions that are likely to survive, which ones are the ones that are that are threatened. How are we dependent on the ones that are threatened? How can we invest in the ones that are going to survive? If there's something new that needs to happen or is happening, you know, again, apply those same tests to it. Is this thing too fragile or can it can it substitute its inputs? Can I invest in this and, and come to depend on that? So there's all that kind of stuff, just building out more of that, the actual infrastructure that isn't dependent on the current order that isn't dependent on the current paradigm. And, and a lot of this, remember, the current paradigm is primarily an ideological thing, right? It's primarily how people think, how people interact, how people organize. So not being dependent on the current paradigm also means, you know, um, having spiritual security in certain ways, having social social resilience in certain ways. Um, so there's a bunch of that. I'm not going to get into the details. I don't think that's entirely relevant, but that full core concept of like do import substitution on society. Um, 
The third thing is this question of like networking and boundary setting. Um, I think, you know, any coherent order has a question of sort of like at least degrees of who's in and who's out. Um, what's the center and what's the periphery? What's what's the orthodoxy and what's the heterodoxy? Um, and I think, you know, it's not that useful at this stage to be like policing each other um, in society. But I think like in the long run, you have to have an idea of who is playing some kind of rebel game and who is playing some kind of a coherent new paradigm game and uh and, and i think like that's a line that, that needs to be drawn because like if you get too many people who are just being disruptive or revolutionary or edgy or whatever in your network as things kind of as, as the ground shifts out from under you those people go from being you know allies of convenience to uh basically a problem and and this again looking at history this happens in many of these social transformations there's a lot of people who are useful um or or sort of accelerate the the thing when you're out but then uh cause a lot of trouble once you're in um and i don't want to think about things again too much in that like that kind of framing but just like think 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 about whether people are sort of building something for the long haul or are just like setting themselves against the established order. I think that's a really important distinction. Um, I think, and I think those are the kinds of distinctions you need to deploy, not just that one. There are going to be other ones in, in, in kind of as you form relationships with other institutions. Um, and, and so those are, I guess, those are the three things that I think are sort of like most important that people are most likely to mix, like miss. You, you actually need to be thinking about who's who's your friend and who is uh, like who is fundamentally your friend, who is just uh, aligned temporarily and who's like not your friend. You need to be doing import substitution to make sure that your little empire is is. Um, part of something that's going to survive and grow and thrive through the coming chaotic transitions. And you need to be, um, you know, thinking temporally in terms of like, what's your strategic sequencing as, as you're um, kind of growing up in the, in the uh, understory, so to speak, to becoming the new canopy. Fascinating. Very fascinating. Well, Wolf, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time today. I'm sure you're, you're a busy guy. I think we covered a lot of ground and yeah, I just found this very, very stimulating and, and, and inspiring as well. I mean, I really appreciate what you and, and the whole Palladium gang are trying to do. I, I really appreciate that you have a, a, a clear and coherent vision and you know, you don't, you don't mince words about it. You say, you say what you think you say, we're trying, you say, we're trying to do, you try to keep it honest and, and straightforward, which I love. And, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for you folks over at Palladium. And if there's ever anything I can do to, you know, be of any help to, to, to your project, definitely stay in touch. I'd love to have you back on the podcast sometime in the future, update us on, on your progress. And certainly if you have any, uh, any, uh, you know, perhaps underrated geniuses over in your, in your community, definitely uh, who want to, you know, come on a podcast and share their big ideas, definitely send them my way. I'd love of to, uh, I'd love to, I'd love to, you know, connect a little bit more with uh, everything you're doing over there. Cause I, I really like what you guys are up to. So I just want to thank you for great. coming on. This was really cool. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thanks a lot, Justin. You had great questions.